Okay, so I'd just like to hand over to Pete Boardman for sampling sites for investments. Over to you, Pete. Thanks very much, Kieran. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm going to spend the next hour or so talking about a whole range of different entomological subjects, really, within the sort of wider remit of sampling sites for, for invertebrates. Um, quick introduction to me, if you haven't met me before. Uh, I currently work for Natural England in citizen science. So I've been involved in entomology in one way or another for 20 plus years. Uh, first, as a freelancer doing work for government agencies like at the time English Nature and Countryside Council for Wales, a range of conservation charities and consultancies. I then joined the Field Studies Council, as Kieran said, I was his predecessor. And I ran a number of different projects, including an entomological project called the Invertebrate Challenge, which worked with a range of people and taught them skills they needed to become entomologists, studying a range of taxa, um, but mostly flies, bees, beetles, bugs and spiders. During that time, I authored a couple of county atlases for Shropshire, one on crane flies and another on shield bugs. And I commissioned another couple of atlases on aculeate hymenoptera and my micro lepidoptera, all I believe are still available from FSC publications. Uh, I joined Natural England in 2016 as a field entomologist in the Natural England field unit and undertook work there until very recently. In 2020, I published an article naming 24 new species to science from Cameroon, um, all crane flies, following a Winston Churchill fellowship, and my, um, more recently, a single new species from Corsica. And I once saw a slug eating a chip. So today's webinar is going to focus on four particular areas that are related to sampling sites for invertebrates. Uh, first, we'll ask the question why we need to sample invertebrates. We'll look at a little bit about the law and ethics around the collection of invertebrate collecting through survey. We'll then look at the appropriate sampling methods for a range of invertebrate groups and, and site selection. Then we'll have a, a, a quick dive into Pantheon. We won't do much on Pantheon because there's going to be um, a, a follow-up webinar specifically looking at that soon. So we'll just um, we'll, we'll just have, have a short introduction to it so you understand what it means. And then we'll look at uh, a piece of work that I did recently within Natural England, which was to conduct a landscape scale invertebrate, invertebrate monitoring program um, across a certain bit of, of geography in the West Midlands. So we'll, we'll talk through those four areas today. So quite a common question that I get asked is, is it warranted to collect living things? Can't we just do it from photographs? And really the answer to that is we can do some of it from photographs, certainly, but voucher collections and voucher specimens are the basis of a vast scientific archive housed by a number of, of national museums that provide access to, the, to anybody, to, um, to, to many, many thousands of species. Um, our whole system of taxon taxonomy is based upon the ability to study these specimens in museums and private collections. Uh, increasingly, DNA studies are altering our perceptions of how many groups, of, of how many groups invertebrates have evolved in their relationships, which is the branch called cladistics. Uh, most species can't be identified in the field or, or even by photographs. Uh, a range can, certainly the group that I study, crane flies, probably round about a quarter to a third can reasonably confidently be identified if we have um, photographs from, from two or three different angles, but most photographs are, are a singular um, photograph and, and not always have the best angle for identification, but many, many more of those species you have to look at under the microscope because there may be um, minor differences such as genitalia, or the pattern of herring, or, or a, a variety of other features. 
and invertebrate sampling as entomologists do it generally has an amazingly small effect on the population numbers compared to other forms of consumption. So generally we do need to collect invertebrates to further the science. Um, and an example of other forms of consumption, um, roughly 99% of a swallow's diet is flying insects. So I'd be quite inter interested to know what the other 1% is. If anybody knows, please let me know. Um, they gulp down millions of invertebrates um, and, in, co and in, in the course of feeding themselves and their young. So the UK population of just the barn swallow is estimated to be 1.5 million birds. And if each of those ate just 350 insects per day, that means more than half a billion insects would be consumed in just one day by just one species. So the biomass is enormous. Uh, and of course, providing invertebrate data is very useful for a whole range of things that affect human beings. In this case, a, a study by CEH and Roth Amstead and the Health Protection Agency looked at the potential for new and existing species of insects with the potential to cause statutory nuisance um, to occur in the UK as a result of current and predicted climate change. Basically, invertebrates are brilliant indicators of environmental change and so readily study, studyable. Um, obviously, we're all aware of the effects of, of climate change, and this is a paper published this year in California, a, a nine year study that looks at the populations of invertebrates in upland and lowland sites. And you can see from the trends in the graphs, uh, both are, are heading downwards. So that sort of backs up how good um, an environmental indicator uh, invertebrate study is. Uh, and obviously we're seeing day by day that the climate is, is, is changing, the amounts of wildfires this year in, in the USA and Europe and elsewhere are the, 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 the biggest number we, we seemingly have ever known. And this is likely to have effects on invertebrates. So understanding them will, will help us in, to, to mitigate these problems. Um, the influence of climate change is going to increase more and more. So our understanding of invertebrates becomes uh, more and more of interest. And so entomologists who are able to study them, who are able to collect them and do some work on the science gets um, even more important day by day. Um, it even reaches the notice of parliament that there are insect declines and extinctions. I'll just give you a, a brief second to read through the, the introduction to the overview of this, um, this paper. Uh, there is a link to the, the full version of this um, in, in the links. Okay. And invertebrate surveys carried out by volunteer naturalists and entomologists allow an awful lot of science to happen. Again, here is a, a couple more examples of um, invertebrates and, and population studies, pollinators on the left-hand side, uh, where we know that declines have taken place between the 50s and 80s, and they've since slowed a little bit in the 90s. Um, and again, with butterflies, um, we, we are aware of extinctions, and we know that some species are increasing in abundance, and, and the majority are probably decreasing and declining because of the, the work that volunteers do and uh, initiatives such as the Roth Hampstead Moth Survey, um, which our very own Field Studies Council participates in, as has, has participated in for a number of years, certainly at, at Preston Mumford. So all that science is dependent upon volunteers. Um, I don't propose to go into protected invertebrate species today. Um, there is a link in the, um, in the Zoom to the terrestrial invert species of the UK and their protection talk 
that I did at the third attempt um, a couple of weeks ago. So please have a listen to, to that if you're, if you're interested. Um, there is a code of conduct for collecting in, invertebrates and, and insects put together by the Invertebrate Link through the Joint Committee for the Conservation of British Invertebrates. Um, it's a fairly long docu document and I don't propose to, to read it all, but I've highlighted a few important parts to the document um, that sort of sum it up really. And I think it's fairly sensible, that no more specimens than are strictly required for a specific purpose should be captured or killed. I don't think people would disagree with that. Uh, individuals of readily identified species, particularly butterflies, should not be killed nor removed from the wild unless required as voucher specimens or for a scientific or educational study. Uh, the previous talk I did highlighted some of the restrictions, some of the species that are protected, and that's something you need to bear in mind. Um, species that do not occur in abundance should not be taken year after year from the same locality. That sort of makes sense and should be, should be obvious, but obviously um, you don't know who else is recording on that site. You don't know who else is taking potentially rare species from that site. So it does need some, some thought and care. Uh, when obtaining early stages by collecting leaf mines, galls and seed heads, etc., never take all that can be found. So, so um, a, a small number or, or, or a single um, example is fine, but um, don't take them all. Uh, importantly, adequate records should always be kept. Um, we'll come back to that later in this talk. And collections should be properly housed so as to prevent deterioration or damage by pests. Um, some of those collections hopefully will go on to be incorporated into museum collections and become really, really important um, scientific um, collections that can be accessed by, by people going forward hundreds of years in the same way that I've been into museums and, and looked at specimens from over 100 years ago and been able to uh, handle them and, and look at them and, and use them. Uh, also, taxa that are listed as being of conservation concern should not be collect collected except with the utmost restraint. I think that's fairly obvious. And the collection of rare or local species from sites where they are already known to occur does not generally provide useful data, should be avoided, except for the purpose of survey or of a scientific study. I think that's all, all pretty sensible stuff. Okay, so why might people be surveying invertebrates? Well, there could be a whole range of different reasons. Could be a landowner wanting to know what he or she has on their, on their land. Um, could be a volunteer recording for a scheme or society, something I certainly do a lot of. Uh, could be a professional survey for SSSI or other protected site. Again, that's something I used to do a lot of through my, through my work program. Um, we might want to inform management of a site um, that has a rare species on or, or a number of um, priority habitats that, that want to be managed better. Um, the person might be a, a panelist or somebody who, who goes out there to record everything. Um, or you might want to survey as part of an educational course. So there's a whole range of reasons and you can probably think of more yourselves. And so where might you be surveying? Um, could be your own garden, your own space, a local area, an area of open space, a monad or tetrad or even hectad recording for some particular recording schemes. It might be a, a local nature reserve, a site of special scientific interest, and or potentially private land, but for all of those, you need permission of the landowner, which is not always easy to get. Just having an issue moving forward, okay. Here we are. Um, so there are a number of other reasons why you might be recording. You might be part of the targeting um, revisits system that the that CEH have, 
have currently started. Um, here is an example of the, the crane fly map. Um, I live in the green square in the middle, just under the word Warrington. And um, all around me are a, a mixture of other green squares, light green squares or pink squares or squares that are unmarked. And these are um, crane fly records uh, where, where there are colours and where there are squares, um, where there are dark green squares. Those squares are deemed to be well recorded. Where there are pink squares, um, there are squares that are um, that ideally should be re-recorded, and the the pale green squares are, are recent records. And everywhere else that's blank, um, they have no records. So it's a good method of trying to um, up your recording. Um, so you click on one of the the green squares. So this is the one um, where I live. Um, I've only lived there a couple of years, and I've recorded the crane flies that I've found in my, my garden. The garden is a very um, typically small suburban garden. It doesn't have a lot of habitat in it. It just has a bit of lawn and a few flower beds, a couple of shrubs, uh, but it's part of a, a, a larger network of gardens that back onto each other. Um, so a few species there, Dichronomia coria, Mitis, Areocanopa diaterna, which is a rather unexpected find. I would probably expect to see that on, um, on wetland sites or upland sites, but it turned up in the garden. Uh, ne Nephrotoma, the tiger crane fly, flavescens, one of the, the commoner species associated with a range of habitats. Uh, Tipula pagana is a fairly common garden species as is Paludosa, that's the, the crane fly that everybody sees at the end of the year. And Tipula rufino is a common garden one, the larvae of which live in, um, in gutters, generally north facing gutters with a bit of moss and a bit of soil in them. Um, so they're the species that have turned up in my, in my monad in, in, in the garden. And uh, that, that particular square is classed as well recorded. Um, it's not just crane flies that, um, that you can target revisit. Um, this is an example from Twitter last week. Um, Elaine Wright, who's a recorder down in, um, in South Wales, has been out and about in her, her area near Cardiff, um, advertising the fact that she's, she's doing it. And then um, a little bit later, showing some of the species that she's found and how, um, how good it is really to be able to watch the maps change colour as you find records, then upload them to iRecord. Um, not just crane flies and grasshoppers though, you can do targeting revisits on soldier flies and ground beetles. Um, there is a link in, in the Zoom to the website where you can find these. So, so please give them a go. Um, I've asked a couple of questions. Um, so the first poll question should, should come up now. And that is, have you heard of target revisiting? It would be sort of quite interesting to know whether people have, uh, have, have come across this before. I will add here that the poll is anonymous, so don't, don't worry about us seeing who's put what. Um, yeah, I, I'll just give you a couple more seconds. We've got most people have, have actually answered quite quickly, Pete. So I'm going to end that and share the results. That's interesting. Thank you very much for that. That's really, really useful. Obviously, we need to uh, continue to do some more um, highlighting of this, which this is one of the ways of doing it through talks like this. And the second question is, now you've heard of it, would you use target revisiting as an activity? So again, the poll is anonymous. So if you even if, even if you wouldn't, we we won't we won't know who's saying what. So please do answer honestly. Um, give you a couple more seconds to um, to vote. Okay. So we've got 
90 percent said and 10 percent said mm -hmm. so so that's really encouraging so so please do get out and um have, have a look at the targeting revisits website and see what you can you can add to the maps um i, I think it's going to be a really exciting way of, of getting more recorders out to um to target these species thank you So can we uh, get rid of that? And we we will move on. If I can get the next slide to think go. Sometimes after a poll, Pete, you need to click back in the window. It might be that. Um. Yeah, I sort of minimised the um the poll, and I can't see it now. So give us a clue. Oh, so I shut that down. Brilliant, thank you. Um, so another initiative that UKCEH are, are looking at is the um, is the decide software. So decide aims to collect new data to improve biodiversity models for decision making by putting recorders motivations at the heart of the process. Um, this is in its, its early stages, but similarly, this is um, the early access version and it's based around where I live, around Warrington. And you can see that the higher priority for recording areas to improve the models are the, the yellow flashes on, on the, uh, within the circle. Um, so that gives you an at a glance um, view of, of where recording would be most welcome. And if you click on one of the little um, flags, it opens up in a box like this and it says this particular area, this example is, is urban um, and details roughly what it might be, but says our model predicts there could be 17 species of butterfly found here. And then it tells you why um, that data would be important potentially. So again, imagine this um, sort of targeting the group that you study the most. It could be a, a really, really good way of encouraging recorders to go and sample in, um, in, in areas that need it most. So we'll, we'll see how um, initiatives like this develop over time. Uh, there are all sorts of invertebrate sampling um, methods, and, and, and this is one that Bug Life have been flagging this summer. It's, it's very nearly closed now. I think it closes um, at the end of August. Um, but it's a way of monitoring invertebrates, not by, by species, but by numbers of bugs that are squashed on car registration plates um, following a journey during the summer probably many of you have, have seen this but it's quite quite an interesting bit of citizen science um, that, that works through a, an app for the Bugs Matter app and um, is another way of, of recording invertebrates for, for science sampling in this case the remains of invertebrates. Um, we'll look at some of the most frequently used sampling methods for invertebrates now um, this is me with my net, um, probably the, the most frequently used method for me certainly is sweeping. And you can see here, I'm looking for, um, I'm looking for flies and a range of other things by sweeping vegetation, bringing the net back and forward. And, um, a large amount of the work I do for sampling crane flies or other flies is, is just undertaken with a net and um, either a pooter uh, or, or a pot. Generally, I tend to put my specimens into, into alcohol. Um, I didn't used to do that. I used to try and pin them as I was going along. So after a day's survey, I, I would go home and um, my insects would be freshly killed using ethyl acetate. And I'd look to pin them at the end of the day 
But when I was working for Natural England, I was surveying back to back for often weeks at a time, and there just wasn't the time to do that. So they ended up going into alcohol to be sorted out at a later date. So I think most of us will be familiar with, with using a net. Um, but there's a whole range of other things we can do to, to find a range of different invertebrates. On the left hand side, my Natural England colleague here is, um, is using a pooter to poot up spiders. Um, so she's disturbing the vegetation. And as they run around the ground, they get pooted up and then they get put into alcohol to be identified at a later date. On the right hand side, another colleague here has got a, a sieve and she's sieved some leaf litter into a white tray. Um, in this case, looking for small snails. Um, that's the reason why she's wearing those goggles uh, to provide a little bit better illumination and, and magnification. Um, so depending on what you want to find, you adjust your methodology accordingly. Here's a group of people at the side of, um, of a slow flowing river and they're turning over rocks uh, to see what they can find. Mostly, um, mostly beetles um, are, are going to be found in, in this sort of uh, location. Uh, this particular river is up in uh, North Yorkshire. Uh, wherever there are um, really good quality woodlands, then we'd start to look within rotting, um, either rotting timber or um, within associated dead wood and, and fungi. Um, here on the left hand side is an old oak in, in actually Windsor Great Forest. And on the right hand side in a different woodland, one of the beetle surveyors has taken some of the material from a tree like the one on the left and is sieving through it to look for a range of saprozoic invertebrates that may be find, found in that sort of situation. Uh, previously, an awful lot of work, would, a lot of time would go into this sort of searching. And um, similarly here, another surveyor um, has taken some, some rotting material from the tree on the right hand side and is searching through it for small beetles um, and will poop them up. You can see the pooter in his hand. Uh, the same surveyor here has done some searches in the, um, in the, the, the tussocks of grass. Um, has taken some, some, some dead grass from those tussocks and sieved it into a tray and he's going through it looking for, again, beetles in, in, this, uh, in, in this occasion on a, on a heathland in the West Midlands. Um, the, the image two or three back where the surveyor was, was looking at, at um, rotting material for um, deadwood beetles. This is an, another way of finding them by using vein traps. In this case, they act as flight interception traps. You can see on the right hand side, uh, this one has been placed in the hollow of a tree, um, relatively high up so people can't interfere with it. And as the deadwood beetles hatch and start to, to move around, they fly into the plastic baffles of the trap and then fall down and gradually work their way down into a collecting bottle um, which, which has either ethyl uh, glycol um, either glycol in it or, or alcohol in it and they act as a preservative and kill the insects and keep them secure so that every two or three weeks somebody can go and change the bottles and those traps can stay out from March through to, to October in, uh, in, in some cases. So a really good method for collecting beetles, particularly saprozylix. Um, you will also get other things in those traps. You'll get flies and um, occasionally spiders and a few other bits and pieces, but the main target is the saprozylic beetles. 
uh, pitfall traps uh, are commonly used to intercept um, ground dwelling creatures. Um, on the left hand side, you can see this one has um, has some either glycol or um, in the old days we would use antifreeze, um, which is sort of less acceptable to use now because it's a hazardous chemical. And the idea is that um, things go wandering around, they fall into the, 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 the traps and they can be retained then for study. Uh, two options, either using the, the pitfall trap uh, wet, in which case with a bit of preservative in it, you can leave it out for, for a little while, um, potentially a, a week or two, and, and go and replace it or dry, then you need to go every day and empty the catch. Um, this is a pitfall trap that was set actually last week. Uh, so it's a very current one. This one was set in the sandy soils of the Brex and left overnight. And when the surveyor went back to, to empty it, the following morning, there were one, two, three, four different species of, of ground beetle in there. Um, this has the advantage of you being able to choose the samples you then take. Um, so if you have lots of, of that particular species that are already from the next pitfall trap along, then you don't necessarily have to collect them. Depends what sort of study you're doing. But do bear in mind if you leave them there for too long, some of the bigger beetles will start to eat some of the smaller beetles. So do bear that in mind. But it's a, it's a really, really good methodology. And I'm sure many of you use pitfall traps already. A um, whole load of things going on here. This was a, a, a Natural England survey that took place up at um, Ingleborough in, in uh, the sort of Lancashire, Cumbria, North Yorkshire area. And this is a, a stream that comes down the, the slope from the, the hills. <clears throat> and we've got three different activities going on here. We've got our mollusk surveyor again with, with glasses on, uh, looking for, for small mollusks from the sides of the, the stream. Um, we've got on the left hand side, we've got um, a, a vacuum sampler that's been used uh, to, to find small ground living invertebrates. They could be beetles, spiders, bugs, a whole range of things going over the grass and collecting those up. Um, in, in the distance on the left, we've got a surveyor who's just done some sweeping around the slightly taller vegetation and is sorting out the catch. And then on the right hand side at the back, we've got another surveyor who's turning over stones and rocks close to the, the side of the stream and looking for, for beetles and, and other invertebrates. So a whole range of things going on there in, in a very um, small space. Um, and this is this is me with a, a slightly larger vacuum sampler. Um, this is called a Vortis sampler, very, very, uh, very expensive and very heavy. Uh, certainly probably outdated mostly these days because people are using um, electronic powered battery uh, samplers, uh, but a, a really good bit of kit. And in this occasion, I was sampling grassy areas in salt marsh near, near uh, Morecambe Bay. Um, there are a variety of other methods of, of sampling and reasons for sampling that, um, that, you, that may not have come, come across your, your knowledge yet. This is the Species from Feces initiative carried out by Nature Metrics. And they did a diet analysis using DNA of Beckstein's bats in Burnwood Forest um, from, from bat feces. And they were able to identify um, 20 or so different species um, from the, uh, the bat dung. Um, interestingly, one of them was a, a crane fly that had never been um, recorded in um, Buckinghamshire, where this was, was tested um, before. So there's, there's some 
question over that. Is it, is it a true record? Um, was this particular species just happened to be sort of flying by? It was a species that is known from, from bog. And there's not an awful lot of that around Buckinghamshire, as far as I'm aware. Um, or, or is it a mistake in the, in, in the DNA um, sample? We, we, we don't know yet, but it's certainly an interesting method. And uh, there's going to be more and more DNA methodologies developed as, as time goes by. Um, part of that is, is through the Darwin Tree of Life project which aims to sequence the genomes of all 70,000 species of organisms in Britain and Ireland. Um, that's something that I've had the chance to, to help out with in the past and, and hope to in the future. Obviously, the, the better sequence of genomes we have for all our species, then the more DNA work we can do. Um, but also, I think it, uh, it is also supported by good old fashioned taxonomy as well. The two are always going to go together, I, I, I think, I certainly hope. So whichever of those methods you use, uh, the key thing is to have a survey plan based upon what you want out of the survey. So in this particular occasion, we have a, a well-designed survey plan um, that this is just a small part of that shows you um, how the surveyor has, has thought about the survey and has listed a whole range of different types of, of recording methodologies that um, is, is going to be or was employed in this particular case with, with spot sweeping and general recording, beating and pitfall trapping are the methods used in this particular occasion. Of course, there are a whole range of, of other methods for sampling invertebrates, and uh, you could probably think of more yourselves, but uh, here, here are just a, a few of those extras. Um, one that I've used in the past, uh, bin bagging trees. So if you wrap uh, black bin bags around the, the diameter of, of a tree and leave it for 24 hours, you'll tend to get um, a whole range of things start to sort of hide with, within the bin bag, spiders and centipedes and wood lice and a, a range of other things. Um, so as a very cheap short term method, you can in increase your catch of those particular groups. Um, targeting sap runs and rot holes of trees for, for saprozyolic flies can basically mean just spending quite a bit of time observing and then sampling sort of sweet netting any particular flies that come into those sap runs or feed at them or uh, or in, emerge from rot holes likewise you can take material away from rot holes and, and rear out anything you find at home um, a lot of my time on some sites is spent by targeting particular sort of seepages and oozes um, so again I, I would very carefully look at the site I'm studying and anywhere with seepages I'd stand there with my net and and, and really you know give that a good a, a good go and you get a lot of quite uncommon species associated with those sorts of habitats so so worth the effort. Um, a lot of surveyors would put down water traps so these could be yellow or white bowls often plastic bowls filled with water and then added to with a bit of um, fairy liquid or other detergent to break the surface tension. Um, hoverflies and bees and a range of other flies get attracted and land on the water, but because the surface tension has been broken, they then uh, get submerged into the water and you can, um, you can collect quite a number of species doing that. It's a bit indiscriminate though, that, that is one issue. Although, and in, in the past we've done this, we've, we've found where the, you know, a lot of one species of bee, for instance, have come into the trap. Um, we've stayed around it and we've sort of rescued them and put them on, on a bit of um, kitchen roll and, and they'll, they'll sort of readily come back to life if you, if you find them in time. Uh, another method for survey is to cut um, 
sort of 10, 12 inch um, squares of carpet or, or lino and um, place them on, on either bare ground or, or, or on grass for a little while. And beetles will tend to congregate under them. So it might be a good way to increase your ground beetle catch. Um, leaf mining is another method. So collecting leaves that have leaf mines on them in, in the autumn. Um, it's a good way of targeting micro moths and a, a range of flies, sawflies and beetles. You could try pheromone trapping for clear wing moths. Um, I've done that a little bit, found that relatively successful. That's quite an interesting thing to do. Um, if you haven't come across those pheromone traps before, um, they're little, little rubber bungs that are soaked in the pheromone of the of the female of, of the the species and males come along um, and these things can last for, for years you generally keep them in the freezer but um, they're very very effective for some species six belted clear wing for instance um, I've had them turn up within about 30 seconds of, of arriving on site um, with them so a really really good method um, egg searches um, butterfly conservation do a lot of this in um, in parts of the country where where black and brown hair streak breed because it can be easier to search for the eggs than, than see the the adults at times uh, and then there are a whole range of uh, DNA methods being developed um, some methods include um, collecting insects in malaise traps and and then blending them up and, um, and, and looking for the genomes in the samples. So there's a whole range of, of methods out there. Um, I'll move on now to talking a bit about surveying for, for Pantheon. Um, in the Pantheon guidance, there's a list of different fieldwork methods for each particular specific assemblage type. And that could be beating and uh, targeted search, sweeping, spot sweeping, pitfall traps, suction sampling or ground searching, a whole range of different things. But for those of you who've not come across Pantheon before, the, the column on the left, the SAP column, might be a little bit confusing. So I'll explain a little bit about that after an introduction to Pantheon. So. Pantheon is a web-based program designed to enable vertebrate assemblages to be identified and tested. It was developed from ISIS software but with extra information added in, such as ecological traits and organism associations. And several, ex, several, several thousand extra invertebrates have been categorized. So currently there are around about 13,000 invertebrates on the system. Um, to be able to use it with any success, you need to have a little bit of entomological understanding or have access to somebody who does, and also to have a reasonable list of invertebrate species to put through the software. Um, and basically, Pantheon is only as strong as the list that you feed into it. Uh, and lists are only as good as the time entomologists can spend compiling them. So, SATs or specific assemblage types give a very specific relationship between invertebrate species and precise habitat. So the example here is this fly, Campiglossa. It's only found on salt marsh where sea aster grows. So you can say that it has a very high fidelity with M311, the salt marsh and brackish marsh invertebrate assemblage. And that is compared with the crane fly simplecta, which is super abundant on salt marsh. But it's also found in a whole range of other wetland sites in land, such as swamp or peat bogs and wet woodland. So it doesn't have a high fidelity to salt marsh because it occurs in so many other sites. And therefore, it's not in the M311 salt marsh assemblage. So other species that have a high fidelity or have been judged to have the high fidelity to salt marsh include a range of other flies, and beetles and bugs and, and a few other, other small groups. And so 
earlier on you saw a, a picture of myself with a, um, a vacuum sampler on a different part of Morecambe Bay SSI. It was part of the same survey. This was probably more of the, the scenic part of Morecambe Bay, i.e. the bit that doesn't overlook the nuclear power station. This one looks north towards the Lake District. So a very, very pretty estuary there. And my, my survey work found a, a range of different things, some interesting flies, and caddis flies and, and soldier flies and, and bugs. In total, I had 145 species from that survey. And I put that species list through Pantheon. And it told me that I had nine high fidelity species, which is the actual target for the M311 sat. And there's a list of the, the species I found that are considered to be high fidelity. And so that survey was classed to have shown the particular site that I surveyed to be in favorable condition. And I'd finally, we'll, we'll do a little bit of um, a review of, of monitoring invertebrates at a landscape scale. Um, so back in 2020, in September, um, a blog on Natural England's uh, website by its director for specialist services um, highlighted the sort of 10th anniversary of the Sir John Lawton report. Um, some of you will, will recall that, and um, particularly the more, bigger, better and joined up spaces for nature that was called for in the, in the report. Um, certainly when that came out, it struck me as, as something we should be doing. And when in 2017, I was asked by the Natural England West Midlands team to do some potential invertebrate survey work across a particular landscape. Um, I very much had that in mind. Um, and so the question I asked myself was which sites naturally been considered to be important for invertebrates, but in the Canic Chase to Sutton Park focus area, which was the area that I'd been asked to, to study. And so I started to think about protected sites, ones that we could influence, protected sites outside of the, um, the natural England land holding that we, that we don't necessarily influence, land under agri-environment schemes and other land and water parcels and ask myself what's what's important here so the focus area is the is, is the map in the middle you can see it looks a bit like a sort of nan bread in, in shape and it runs from um, just south of uh, of stafford in the north to the outskirts of, of birmingham to the south um, the shaded areas within the map are all triple SIs, protected sites that run um, sort of down the backbone of the, of the focus area. But something that really surprised me was that less than a percent of the total area of the focus area was considered to, to have any importance for invertebrates. Um, and that most of those triple SIs didn't have any notified or reportable features or recognized assemblages. Um, that surprised me for a couple of reasons. One, because I'd worked on some of them before and, and knew them to be important sites. So for instance, in the very south of the map, the big uh, shaded area there is Sutton Park National Nature Reserve, which although on the citation, is only, it only mentions being important for the holly blue butterfly. Um, it's actually a really, really good invertebrate site. I knew that it, it held all sorts of invertebrate interest. Um, Brockton Coppice in the, in the north um, was the only site where actually had done any, any specific invertebrate work associated with invertebrate assemblages. And in this case, a, a detailed survey for saprozylic invertebrates had, had taken place and a, a number of different Pantheon sats had been identified as being important. And as a result of the survey work, Brockton Coppice was considered within the top 100 UK sites for saprozylic invertebrates, so, so of importance. 
Um, so I started to, to look how we might address a landscape scale survey. So the first thing I did was to develop a methodology to highlight, survey and report on habitats that might be important for invertebrates at a landscape scale. So initially this was done through a desktop survey. Uh, I then carried out some habitat survey on a bigger scale and um, followed that up by using the first two sections there to the desktop survey and the habitat survey to inform step three, which was to design a set of proxy invertebrate surveys using invert groups that represent key habitat features across that landscape. Um, once the invertebrate survey was complete, some data analysis using Pantheon was carried out, and then the dissemination phase kicked in. Um, I produced an at-a-glance map um, via WebMap, which is our, our Natural England internal sort of mapping system, to clearly show where the important invertebrate, invertebrate sites are in that landscape and highlight why they're important. Um, so the desktop survey, so we had some data available um, from, from Canic. Um, we had the Webb and Holland Saprozylic survey from Brockton Coppice, which I've highlighted. I had some existing knowledge of a few day flying Lepidoptera surveys that have been done around the focus area, including surveys for Dingy Skipper. Um, we had some data from historical surveys for Sutton Park. And um, there were some recent surveys that I've been involved with in a, a local nature reserve in Walsall. Uh, there was slightly sort of sketchy knowledge, previous aculeate surveys by a couple of recorders. And we had um, some records from the NBN that we could use. So they informed where we, we um, were going to survey. Here's me doing one of the habitat survey work. Um, this is on Canic Chase, um, the very sort of northern part of Canic Chase that land at the butts up to Shubra Hall. And you can see that uh, this area here is a wetland that has a, 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 basically a, a lot of older trees on it. Quite interesting bit of habitat. Um, on the left-hand side, uh, we've got some of the Natural England um, survey team helping to do habitat surveys. And this is part of a sand pit on Gentle Shore Common on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, we had some help from the local authority in Walsall who came out to, to do some survey work with us on some of their land holdings. This is a heathland here on, on the right, close to Brown Hills. Um, so when we put the habitat and desktop survey results together, we identified a group of, uh, so a, a number of groups of invertebrates that we felt could be proxy for a full invertebrate survey across that landscape. So they were aculeates, so bees, wasps, and ants. They were day flying Lepidoptera, particularly section 41 species where we could find them, species like dingy skipper. Crane flies were the proxy for the wetland diptera and saprozylic beetles, based largely on the work that had already been carried out by, by John Webb and Tom Holland. So Natural England, i.e. me, carried out crane fly survey work in 2018 and 2019. Stephen Falk was contracted to do some maculate hymenoptera survey work over the same period of time. We surveyed some of the brownfield sites within the focus area. We used the uh, Webb and Holland report for saprozyonic beetles. Stephen Falk was also carrying out a full survey of Sutton Park for site managers um, who were building City Council and kindly shared his interim report at the end of 2018. And quite recently, we've been testing some of the outputs using Coleoptera from a Valley Maya site to compare with the results we got from the crane fly survey work. Um, so these are some of the habitats involved. Um, some, some nice wetland habitats, so with the brook at Canic Chase that's got bits of dead wood in it. Um, there are bits of a sphagnum bog dotted around the, the focus area. Uh, this one is at Chase Water, Triple S I, and it's a boardwalk that 
um, actually was there at the start of the survey, but uh, disappeared by the end of it. Um, a, a local nature reserve, this is called Lees Wood. Most of the interest on this site is um, in the sessile oak woodland with, um, with understory of bluebells, but it has some interesting wetland features that turned out to be really quite important at a landscape scale. Uh, there's a calcareous fen at Sutton Park, which has a lot of interesting things in it. Um, a valley mire at Gentleshaw Common. Um, valley mire is, a, is a, a really rare habitat in the West Midlands. Um, it doesn't occur very frequently at all, so it's of great interest. Um, plenty of, of swamp and fen around, in this case, Jockey Fields, Triple SI in the middle of the focus area, but also this habitat is repeated at a site just up the road called Clayhanger. Um, in terms of the aculeates, uh, the sand pit at Gentle Shore Common is, is of, of great interest. This is mostly south facing and really, really important. Uh, lots of heathland in the wider Chase Water Triple SI. Here you've got a load of bilberry and, um, and, and heather. Um, some heathland restoration has been done on some of the sites, particularly within Chasewater Triple SI, but Hensford Hill. The, the land managers have deliberately cleared areas back to, to, to bare sand for the aculeates. This is south facing and uh, quite a significant area of, of work. Um, also adjacent to a load of bilberry, which is uh, good for pollinating aculeates. Um, elsewhere in the Chase Water Triple SI, um, an area of, of sandy ground had been taken over by, by local um, cyclists and they, they turned it into a cycle track, uh, track, which on the face of it is quite a damaging operation on a, on a Triple SI, but actually has provided a load of, um, a load of good open sandy areas for aculeates. Um, so it's, it's not probably what anyone would advocate, but um, it's, it's turned it into a, a, a really good site for aculeates because they've, they've cleared some of the scrub and, and kept some areas open and stacked a bit of, um, bit of sand as well at the sides. And another area of, of open sandy habitat it, within Shoal Hill Country Park. So hopefully you'll sort of get the feel of the habitats for the bees and wasps. And then also at Clayhanger, there's an area of, um, of brownfield site. There's uh, areas that have been um, in, industrially altered and bird's foot trefoil grows in, in, in reasonable patches um, in south facing banks like this one. And they provide habitat for dingy skipper. Um, so we carried out survey work on 12 sites across the focus area. Um, a total of 165 species of aculeate were found and 99 species of crane flies were recorded across all of the sites. Um, several of these records were, were new to the West Midlands and we found a number of Section 41 records um, across the sites as well. And so this data enabled us to carry out an, an assessment of specific assemblage type assemblages using Pantheon. Um, a quick spread of, um, of the sites and the numbers of species there, we dwell on that too much except to say that over 100 species were found on, on gentle shore of bee wasp ant and anything over 100 is, is exceptional um, and makes it a nationally important site. Um, a good spread of, of culiates elsewhere and a good spread of crane flies. Uh, probably one of the most or the more noteworthy thing, things on that table is that three section 41 species were recorded at Pelsall Common Local Nature Reserve. Um, it's quite an interesting site, not a triple SI, probably should be. Um, in terms of rarity value, as I developed this work, I got a feel that anything over 10% rare was probably significant. 
And you can see there, there are a number of sites that had over 10% rare of, um, of aculeates. So Gentle Shore Common being one and Shoal Hill being another, the country park there, as well as part of um, Chasewater where the, the heathland management work for aculeates had taken place. And then um, in terms of the crane flies, um, several sites there, Leeds Wood, a local nature reserve, clay hanger, and uh, part of Canic Chase uh, and Bar Beacon, a heathland site, had a uh, percentage of rare species higher than 10. Uh, in terms of what I did with the Pantheon assemblages, I did bespoke ones. So if you look at the W312 Pantheon sat for Sphagnum bog, uh, the target is eight. And to survey it under common standards monitoring guidelines, you would need, normally need to look for flies, beetles, spiders, etc. You can see the makeup of species there in the pie chart. So flies are a percentage of that, 25 species in total, 22% of, of the total high fidelity species are identified as, as flies. Um, nine of those are crane flies. I looked at that list and took away the three species that are only known from Scotland, as obviously they're not going to occur within the focus area. One species I felt had been misapplied but there are also a number of other sphagnum associated species that for whatever reason were left out of the original list. So I included those in and then readjusted the target. So um, the top one is the misapplied species. The next three are the Scottish species. The remaining five were, were the ones from the original W312 and I added in the ones the species in blue that I all felt were, were important and should be added. And also, if you look at the conservation status of a lot of those species, they're not necessarily common anyway. Um, so I, I think I was justified in adding them. And as it turned out, I got four species from um, of crane fly from the Valley Maya and it, uh, Onto that basis, I used it to show that the site was favourable using this methodology, this landscape scale methodology. Um, once you apply the new or bespoke SAT assemblages, but also some existing SAT assemblages from that list, uh, most of the field layer ones are untouched. Um, you start to, to see where the invertebrate interest is across the focus area. And if you compare the map on the left, um, which was the situation we had at the beginning with the map on the right, um, following the, the survey work, um, you can see that it starts to give you a better indication of the value of that landscape for invertebrates. Um, the next step would be to survey outside of our protected sites network. Um, and, and see what else is going on in that landscape. But that at least gives you a, an idea of, of how a, a reasonably small amount of targeted survey work using this methodology across the landscape can really increase our understanding of that landscape. Um, to sort of finish off really, just to, to remind people that Collecting invertebrates using the methods we've, we've highlighted earlier is one of the easiest things you can ever do, but identifying them is one of the more difficult. So do bear that in mind if you go out with a net, if you set a malaise trap up or put pitfall traps down or do whatever other methodology you, you decide you want to do to survey your uh, particular area, do bear in mind you're going to end up with a lot of samples and they do need to be identified, otherwise it's pointless to, in, in collecting them. And of course, again, a regular reminder for any courses I do that we should all put our data on, on iRecord so that it informs conservation. Uh, iRecord data goes to uh, be, become the basis behind the target revisiting maps as well as the IUCN status reviews and is 
absolutely vital information used by recording schemes. So I think that's it from me today. I hope you found that interesting. And uh, back to you, Kieran.